Warm welcome to you all as we um, have a few hymns before our lesson this evening. Our first hymn will be 595. <clears throat> and it's men's and ladies this evening. Are the men's in Yastel? Yes, men's in Okay. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he played to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me Next him, three seven four. There's a fountain free to oh sorry, I'm going wrong one at all. There is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be safe to sin no more, be safe to sin no more, be safe 
saved to sin no more, till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Yes, since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Our closing hymn is the that song I was starting to lead. Two eight six will be our next one. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, though you are far away, wonderful story of love, still he doth call today. Calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation, wonderful story of love, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love, for all the pure and blessed, rest in those mansions above us, with those who've gone on before us. Chorus, wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love. <clears throat> four nine four. happy day that fixed my choice on thee my Savior and my God. Well may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live
live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Oh, happy pond that seals my vows to him who merits all my love. Let cheerful anthems fill his house while I might sacred shrine I move. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Tis done the great transactions done, I am my Lord and He is mine. With and I followed on, drum to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. And I lost him. Is there's a fountain free? Nine zero nine. <clears throat> There's a fountain free, tis for you and me, let us haste, so oh, haste to its spring. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and it bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come, tis for you? soul, yeah, the welcome call, tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam, from the throne of life now it flows. While the waters roll, let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not its pure waters share. Tis for you and me and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Yeah, the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. We'll have a word of prayer and then men will reign in the auditorium and the ladies will go through to the room at the back. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Holy Father and mighty God, we are so grateful to you that you are our king. 
And we hallow your name, Father. We hallow the great name of the great I Am. The name of Yahweh, the name that was and is and forever will be. And we look forward to that day, God, when you will come to judge this world because of the wonderful news that in Jesus Christ we have no condemnation. And we thank you, Father, for your incredible love evidenced to us, to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is this love that we try and return to you as best we can in the songs that we sang and the prayers that we pray and the words that we dwell in or in your word that we dwell in. And I pray, Father, that this evening be an evening of encouragement and strengthening and enrichment in our lives and in our souls and in our walk with you, Father, that we never forsake our first love, that we never lose our zeal, and that we continue to strive to serve and honor and praise and worship and magnify your name in a way that bears fruit to you and in a way that pleases you and in a way that shows our love for you. Father, we, we give you thanks, we give you glory. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get started. So, a very good evening to um, everyone here who's present today. Um, for those who are watching online, I'd like to also welcome you as well. Um, today, we are going to be continuing on um, with the end of the month topics and continuing from section one, which is about why I teach the good news. And we'll be looking um, at chapter five of that reference material. And so, I guess for um, today's Bible class, we're just going to be looking at a couple of messages about um, the story of Esther and what we can learn from it and um, how we can relate this to the good news. So um, there's quite a bit that I'll be going through today, um, especially with the recap of the book of Esther. Um, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. So the story of Esther starts with um, King Xerxes, and he's looking for a new queen um, after the old one. Queen Vashti uh, refuses to come before uh, the king with her royal crown to show the people and the princes her beauty. And we can read of this in Esther chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. And that reads, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Habona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha, and Carcass, seven eunuchs, uh, who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. Um, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought um, by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. And from... Esther chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, um, it starts off with us seeing all the prettiest girls in the land were brought into the harem in Susa. And now these are the verses we are also introduced to Esther, which is her Persian name, and Hadassah is her Hebrew name. And we're also introduced to Mordecai. Mordecai is Esther's um, cousin and basically took the responsibility to raise her as if it was her own daughter as Esther's parents had um, both died while she was a child. You could tell Mordecai was actually quite a good father figure. Um, for Esther, as he actually genuinely was concerned for her, and that in verse 11, uh, we see that Mordecai walks in front of the court of Haram um, to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her, which we can see, oh, which reads, and every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the woman's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. 
And we can also see in verse 10 that Mordecai, yep, verse 10, that Mordecai warns her not to tell anyone um, that she was Jew. There's obviously this kind of perceived fear um, that it would go badly for her if she did re reveal that she was a Jew, um, but we're not told uh, why at this point. And we can read here, Esther had not revealed her people or family for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. We can also read in verse 12 to 14, um, which reads, each, woman, each young woman's um, turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the woman, a woman, uh, for thus were the days of their preparation uh, apportioned six months with oil of uh, myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared each young woman uh, went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the woman's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of the woman to the custody of Shazgaz, um, sorry, I'm really butchering the names, um, but the king's eunuchs who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. And so, yeah, we, we see quite a horrifying situation that is unfolding. The women have been preserving and beautifying themselves for months in preparation um, to meet the king. And so all they're doing at this moment um, to meet the great king, yeah, so they're preparing for this moment to meet the great king of Persia and to try and win his favours. And the scripture makes it clear in uh, verse 14 that each woman goes uh, to the king at night and leaves in the morning, and, and they do not go back to the harem of the virgin woman, but instead they join a new group of uh, women. They were not sent home, uh, they were not set free. They did not go back to the life they had before. Um, they were swept up by the king. Um, and these women um, would never see the king again unless the king asked for her again. And unfortunately, this is the world that Esther is currently in. And, you know, and she doesn't have a choice in it. So if we were to kind of just take a break right here, you know, who would not look at their life and wonder where God is? You know, you'd start to question why isn't God kind of st um, like not stepping in right now to help her. Um, but as we read on, we start seeing that Esther, um, yeah, soon takes favour in the king. So if we uh, read from verse 17, um, yeah, which reads, the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favour in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And so, yeah, we see in verse 17, when it was Esther's turn with Xerxes, it soon went into her favour as he liked her more than he did with any other woman and crowned her his new queen. And I guess in despite of the horrible circumstances that is going on, uh, God is able to raise Esther up, you know, so that she can be a queen. And in chapter 3, we see that King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, uh, the, the Agagite, um, to being elevated above all the other officials and servants in the palace. We see that in verse 2, that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to Haman. Um, and because of this, Haman wants to destroy all the Jews throughout the kingdom of Xerxes, which you can read in verse 6. And so, and so now we've come to chapter 4, where Mordecai finds out about Haman's plan to kill all the Jews and he becomes very distressed. The only solution to stopping the slaughter uh, would be for Esther uh, to beg Xerxes' favour and plead with him to basically stop, stop it. But Esther knows that if any person goes uh, to the king inside of the inner court without being cold, there is only one law and you get put to death. The only way that 
this does not happen is if um, the king extends his golden scepter so that uh, you may live. And you'd think that it shouldn't be an issue for Esther because she's, she is the queen and King Xerxes absolutely loved her um, back when you read chapter 2. But now she actually hasn't been called um, to come up into the presence of the king for 30 days. And also we have to remember back in chapter 1 on what happened to Vashti um, where she was queen but it exactly didn't go well for her um, for when she violated uh, the king's command. And so Esther's point in chapter 4 verse 11 about her fearing for her life is actually quite a reasonable, um, you know, it's quite reasonable. And what Mordecai is asking for her to do is um, quite dangerous. But Mordecai tells Esther that, you know, even she will not escape being killed with the rest of the Jews. Um, she may think she's safe, but she's not. And now Esther shows her bravery and she's ready to uh, risk her life to speak to the king. She will go to the king even though it's against the law. And if he doesn't raise his golden scepter um, to her, then she may die. And so this is it. In, in chapter 5, we see Queen Esther standing in Xerxes' court and she, she again has won the favour in the king's sight. So the king extends his scepter towards her and she touches the tip of the scepter, which is a sign of acceptance and thanks for the king's favour. Um, and so for Esther to come in without being summoned uh, shows to Xerxes that there's something that she wants. And so Xerxes asks um, for her request, it's actually quite interesting how she doesn't just blurt out the problem right then and there and just say, and just yeah, tell Xerxes that you know, Haman is planning to destroy the Jews. But instead, she wanted Haman and Xerxes uh, to come to a feast in which she's prepared. And so the king and Haman go to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine, the king asks Esther you know, what her request is. And she replies to Xerxes that if she has found favour in the sight of the king, then let us have another banquet um, tomorrow. And then at tomorrow's feast, she will um, make her request known um, to the king, which you can read in Esther chapter 5, verse 7 to 8, which reads, Then Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this, if I have found favour in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And so if we uh, see in Esther chapter 5, verses 9 to 14, um, you know, we can see that ha Haman is absolutely thrilled um, that he's being invited again uh, for an exclusive banquet with Esther and Xerxes, but when he sees Mordecai again at the king's gate, he's filled with wrath, and, but he still is able to retain himself. He tells all of his friends and his wife what a great day um, he's had and how, the, and how this is all going to be happening tomorrow, but it's interesting to see in verse 13 that nothing satisfies him because he's, he still sees Mordecai, the Jew, um, sitting at the gate every time. And his wife and friends have a solution for him to basically build a pole that's 75, 75 feet high um, and have the king impale Mordecai on it. And Haman absolutely loves this idea and gets this pole constructed. And so we've gone through quite a bit of an introduction um, to the story of Esther. Uh, but yeah, I want us to look uh, more, at more particularly in this part of the story. So in chapter 6, verses 1 to 13, um, because this is where I reckon like the quiet hand of God happens. So we see in chapter 6, verse 1, that the king is unable to sleep. So Xerxes gets one of his servants to read a book of memorial deeds regarding the empire. On the record, Mordecai's name pops up as he is the one that, ki that saved the king um, from assa the assassination plot by two of the eunuchs. 
And so Xerxes asks, what honour have we given to Mordecai for this? And basically they mention, well, nothing has been done for him. No sooner when he was given this answer, um, Haman comes in wanting to, to speak to Xerxes about hanging Mordecai. Um, so the king asks, what should be done for a man who um, he wishes to honour? And Haman in his arrogance thinks that there's no doubt that the king is obviously talking about him. So he says, he says um, that the king should have a royal uh, robe brought, put on that individual, have him ride on the king's horse in the square of the city and be proclaimed that this is, this is done to the man who the king delights to honour. And so the king, Xerxes, he absolutely loves this idea and tells Haman to do that for Mordecai. So instead of Mordecai being hanged, Haman has Mordecai honoured um, like by his own suggestion. And then now in chapter 7, we see that both Xerxes and Haman uh, went to the feast, which was prepared by Queen Esther. And Xerxes again asks, what is her request? And now she finally reveals it. So if we read from uh, Esther chapter 7, verse 3 to 10. Verse 3, then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favour in your, in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Uh, oh yeah. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Habona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. So we see... Esther finally reveals her request. She asks that her life and the lives of her people be spared because the Jews have been sold um, to be destroyed. And after the king hears of this news, he's absolutely outraged and he wants to know who's done it. And Esther, Esther finally points out that it was Haman. Then Haman becomes very terrified and he pleads with the queen. But as he falls and as the king returns from the garden, he thinks that Haman assaulted the queen. And the guards immediately take him um, away with his face covered. And in verse 9, we saw that one of the eunuchs tells Xerxes that Haman had prepared um, the gallows for Mordecai. And the king commands um, Haman to be hung on that very pole. And, you know, we get to see the irony of that. And now in chapter 8, we see that Esther saves the Jews. Uh, Xerxes had given Esther the house of Haman, and Xerxes had given Mordecai the signet ring um, that Haman possessed, and uh, Mordecai also was, uh, possessed uh, Haman's estate as well. And so Esther pleads again with the king to overrule uh, the letter devised by Haman, which he declared to exterminate the Jews, and the king tells Esther and Mordecai to write another decree as they see fit, and they're to put the uh, king's name and the seal with the king's ring on it so that that cannot be revoked. And so, yeah, that's it. The Jews were saved. And, you know, we see that Esther was a, 
was a woman of great courage, loyalty, and uh, selflessness. You know, she defended and protected her people, who were the Jews, and she risked her life to stand before King Xerxes. And you know, there will also come a time um, in everyone's life when we must stand for what we believe in what is right, um, even if there is a potential pain that is involved with it. And Esther was the Jews' greatest hope in retaining their physical lives, and she saved them. She courageously made her request known to Xerxes and acted with great faith, which we can read in Esther chapter 4, verse 16, which reads, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. God can use your courage to affect the lives of others. Esther's brave actions uh, saved her people and brought good rewards, whereas Haman's evil actions brought him swift punishment. And, you know, we should also act with such faith and courage just like Esther did. And some, things, some other things that we can learn from Esther's story is that God was in charge. Even though God is not actually mentioned in the book of Esther, um, we can see like a elaborate string of coincidences um, that leads to the rescue of the Jews. Uh, he sees his people through difficult times and trying times, even though his involvement cannot easily be seen. Um, God doesn't always act in obvious or miraculous ways, yet he still acts. And the number of just happens in Esther's story is just too great to see any other explanation than that, than that God had planned and intervened on behalf of his people. And so even though God is not directly mentioned in the story, but he works in miraculous ways that, um, that may not be understood or seen by men. And we can read of this in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, uh, which reads, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. God doesn't tell us everything he does. Uh, those involved in God's plans are not certain as to exactly how God's, um, or God plans for these events to take place. Uh, Mordecai is quite confident that the Jews would survive because of God's unfulfilled promise that we can read in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. But he's not certain if Esther is part of the plan or not. Um, so if we read Esther chapter 4, uh, verse 14, which I have not put. <laughs> Sorry, I must have made a mistake. But if uh, I'll read it from here. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So neither Mordecai or Esther needed to know what God's plans were. They did their best, um, they knew how, and they left, they left the rest um, in God's hands. And God does the same for us. And we can read of this in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verses 5 to 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And God often turns things around. There is so little um, that we can control in our lives, but Esther reminds us you know, who is in control and that we can depend on him to turn things into good. And if we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 28, which reads, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so we've seen quite a few times um, in the Old Testament that God provides for us and protects his people. God saves uh, the Jewish nation through Esther, and there are many instances in the Bible where God saves his people through someone. 
We can see another example where God saves the Israelites from the Egyptians through Moses. Um, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt from Pharaoh, who was pursuing them, and God had saved the Israelites by allowing them to cross uh, the Red Sea. And when Moses had stretched out his hand over the sea, the sea returned back to its full depth, and the Egyptian army was in it, which you can read in Exodus chapter 14. And so tying this um, to the good news um, for the end of the month lesson theme and how this applies to us um, in today's day is that we know that God saves us through uh, sin and death through sending Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice to pay the price for our sins and so that we can be reconciled back to God and if we were to remain faithful that uh, we would have the hope of eternal life. The reference material definitely gets some of these points right with the first one being the king of Persia, Xerxes ruled an empire, but Jesus rules all heaven and earth. And we can read of that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, which reads, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus isn't a king who loves us for a night and then uh, lets us go like King Xerxes, but he gives us a costly love that that's faithful forever. And if we read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And if we read in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this. Um, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And Jesus did give his life for us because he loved, he loved us and there is no greater love than someone laying down their life for someone else. Another point in the book um, is that it mentions Jesus doesn't execute all traitors like Xerxes even though we have sinned against Jesus but he has gone to the gallows in our place shedding his blood impaled at his hands and feet. Um, and in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, God offers salvation for all because he loves all his people, and so he offers Christ as the sacrifice for our sins. We can read of this in 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 9 to 10, which reads, In this the love of God was manifested manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him in this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be um, uh, to be the propitiation for our sins and and God sends Christ to reconcile us back to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus is the way to a better life. In John chapter 14, verse 6, um, Jesus said to him, I am the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus is the way to God, and he is the way to eternal life. God desires all men um, to be saved. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus is offered as the ransom for all. We can read of this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 to 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself 
a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so in conclusion, God can orchestrate events and life experiences to allow our courage to bring him glory or glory to him. Sometimes God may, may have placed you in the right place at the right time, like Esther, and yet you may, not, you may not see how God's agenda is unfolding in your life right now, but we can pray and ask God for the courage to do what he calls us to do. And just like Esther and Moses, God has cared for his people in the past, and so he will care for us today. And we can read of that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And, yep, that's it for my lesson today. Is there any questions or comments? No. Okay, all right, let's close in a word of prayer. Almighty Father, we thank you for this day where we can come here together to sing praises to your name and to learn another portion of your word. And Lord, we thank you for sending your only perfect and begone son to come here on earth to pay the price for our sins and so that we can be reconciled back to you and if we remain faithful to have the hope of eternal life. And Lord, we thank you for your word that we're able to uh, learn from it and to help us to become better Christians and Lord at this time we pray that you please be with each and every one of us here today and um, and that uh, you please be with us as we go back to our respective homes and Lord once again we thank you for all the many blessings you so richly bless us with and in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>